incredible that we'd actually be talking about, hey, you got a song in the charts right now. I mean, that's something I think just about anyone would be like, yes. Yeah, yeah it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, it's been a long uh, road. Uh, I, obviously, I've been a songwriter and the song has been in the charts before, just not with me singing it. So it's kind of a, a unique feeling. What, what, and like describe what that feels like when, and for anyone watching, we're talking with John, John DeNicola and we're talking about Hungry Eyes in particular and the album, The Why Because, but that his version of his song, Hungry Eyes is right now in the, in the top 30 of the, of the adult contemporary charts, depending on which chart you look at there, it's all right around 29, 28, right in that range right now. You're in the top 30 of, of adult contemporary nationwide. So when you, yeah, was, yeah, when when you see your name listed there under artists and the whole list of everyone else who's currently on the chart right now, you got your Post Malones, you got your Maroon Fives, you got your Marin Morrises, all the big names right now. And then there's John DeNicola right, right there. First time you yeah. saw that, what did you think when you're the artist and you're on the chart? Well, I, I was pretty, uh, I'm, I'm pretty taken aback. I mean, um, it, it, among those names, to be among those names, uh, and to be truthful, I never necessarily saw myself as an artist. It's, 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 a, it's a new thing for me. Um, just in, in I, I, I have this studio upstate New York in my barn and I, I, testing out the room and I, I started recording uh, I've, um, You're the Only One, which is a song I also wrote with Frankie Previtt who I wrote the Dirty Dancing songs with. Um, and uh, I, we did this song for the movie Avenging Angelo. And it, um, uh, it was in the movie, Steve Holy sang it, but it, it never was released as a song. So I started, you know, testing my room out and I, I said, I always wanted to re-record re that song in a way, you know, hopefully that somebody else could cover it and maybe it would, you know, be released. And so I, I, in my quest to do that, I always heard the song a certain way, said, well, who am I going to get to sing this? And I put my voice down on it and, and I played it for some people and they were positively responded. So um, I, that sort of snowballed it. And, and then I, I said, well, let me do this song of my, you know, that I wrote and this song that I wrote. And then I said, let me try Hungry Eyes. And I spoke to my son, who's a drummer, and I said, how can I do Hungry Eyes? I mean, it's, people know the song, it's been around. And he said, well, somebody, some modern rock bands um, kind of take that um, sort of 80s synth pop and modernize it for today. You know, somebody like Tame Impala or, or you know, bands like that. And he said, so why don't you take what they were drawing from the 80s synth pop, which is what Hungry Eyes was, and just sort of modernize it the way they would. And it started with him playing drums in a certain manner. And then I just piled on the, the keys and went synth pop with it. And um, that's how it came out. I saw you playing that Juno 106 in the video. Yes. For, which, for the, which, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that, go ahead. that was the keyboard that I originally wrote the song on. Is that literally the actual machine? That's the same one from the 80s? The same one. Wow, okay, even better. I, I, was, I was thinking, well, this is good. He found the same one. Well, you, maybe you actually still have it sitting around. So, okay, there's a little bit of music history in that. Yep. Very nice. Um, well, let's I'll focus on the video and then go into the arrangement and then kind of go back in time that way. We'll kind of work backward that way. So creating the video for this one, I would... And this is something I'm struck by walking around here in the Eau Claire, Wisconsin area, and I'm sure, I mean, everywhere around the country, and, and we're all wearing masks, but until you just see the eyes, which I've discovered, seeing people around, and you don't necessarily know who they are, but it's almost a more powerful way of seeing a person, and I never really expected that effect to happen. I mean, you don't see their nose, you don't see their mouth, and that's part of the whole face, but there's something really powerful coming out of just their eyes, and I get the same effect watching that video with all these people wearing all sorts of different face coverings, different kind of masks, et cetera. So what was, 
maybe I'm describing it right now, but what was the objective of making that, the, that video for Hungry Eyes? Well, you know, again, what am I going to do video-wise that hasn't been done? Everything, you know, the big budgets and, you know, and what can we do to separate ourselves and, and, and get any kind of message across? And my wife actually mentioned, well, everybody's wearing masks and that makes us focus on each other's eyes and, and our expression has to be made through our eyes and a connection and, and everybody's looking for a connection now because we're all, you know, kind of separated and, you know, sequestered. So um, we, we, we thought at her, at her idea really was to just get everybody. My son was still here. He's now back in New York city, but he was still up here at the time and he's a filmmaker. So he got some shots of me, but then I asked friends, family, healthcare workers around here to just turn their phone, you know, sideways like this and just film yourself with your face mask on for uh, five seconds and, you know, just to try and express, you know, through your eyes, whatever, you know, hungry eyes, you know, and so that's what we did. And uh, it's uh, it really, uh, people have been responding really well to it. It, it seems to, you know, it's semi lo fi but it's, it's um, it puts across a, a feeling. Um, I've had people respond and just say it's such an uplifting. It's an uplift that I need right now, <laughs> you know. So uh, it came out really, you know, really well. A, a guy around here, a friend of mine, David Frame, actually did the editing and he did a wonderful job just to, you know, because we we were just given a my phone, <laughs> iPhone videos. So you know, he he did a wonderful job. I think. Lo-fi is kind of the way to go right now. That's with a whole lot of videos. I've been seeing other artists. You can tell, like I've been watching some of Nora Jones's videos of late, and you can tell they were shot in like wherever she's probably at in quarantine. But they're but they're done in a certain way to make them look more artistic. You've seen that with uh, Jonas Brothers. They do a thing with like three white cards. So how do you make something? It, it it reminds me of the earliest days of music video. Reading there, the limitations were technological. But it's kind of the same thing of what do you do with limited opportunities? Well, okay, let's have, like in your case, everyone has a mask, you got to hold it a certain way and let's create something from that. Right, yeah, no, I, I can't be happier with the way it came out, so. And you know, it's funny, after a while, you, you um, once some time passes, I, I'm hearing the song, now that there's a video, I'm hearing the songs, I'm not hearing it as the guy sitting here recording and producing and mixing it. I'm hearing it now through their eyes and, 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 it, and it, I'm just, you know, I'm happy with the outcome of sonically too, besides the video. You have a different arrangement in the song. I mean, not, in, not just inherently different from the Eric Carmen hit recorded version or even from Frankie Previtt's original recorded version, but also there's a part in the second verse, can't remember exactly where, but I think that's like where, like the bass kind of drops out or what, what we, you know what you did it, but but there's a certain part where the where the under part kind of goes away for a bit, then it comes then it comes back, and I was hearing that going, well that's a different approach. So how was how did you go at all right when you actually are rearranging the song for yourself? How did you want to make it a little different besides just the okay we're going to use the synthesizer that that way? Yeah, well again I th I I I. I, I through my son or just on my own, I've been listening to a lot of modern indie rock bands. And I just was trying to approach it that way. I, I, I went with a, a very heavy bass um, pattern, a, a different kind of bass pattern than the original. And, and in the verse, I mean, in the choruses, I, it's like a one, four, five. It's like F, B flat, C. But the first time through, I just, I just, kept pedaling the F with, and then the four and the five chord uh, the first time around. And then the second time through, I, I do the one, four, five. So that, you know, just that sort of made it, it to me, it sounded a little even, uh, even more retro, if you can get more retro. It sounded very seventies to do that, mm -hmm. but in a modern context with synths. Um, the part you're talking about, I think, is the second verse at uh, halfway through the second verse, we, um, 
just took some effects and um, um, I'm trying to remember what it was. It's kind of like a, um, the old John Lennon um, uh, ATP, automatic, uh, I can't think of what it's called. I think, I, yeah. Basically yeah. a doubling thing. And uh, a doubling and filtering. And so the drums kind of pan hard left and right, but get real thin and it's like a... Mm -hmm. And then it, and then it comes up and it comes back in, and uh, I'm thank you for noticing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a you know a kind of a um, effects trick. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll we'll go back. We'll keep with Hungry Eyes and now go back with that song so to the original writing of the song. Uh, and actually, let's go back even a little bit further and then kind of re rewind back to the writing because it involves Frankie Previtt. Yes. When did you first meet him? I know you, you played on, on Making the Point on bass. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's what I think I saw that. Did you play on that Frankie and the Knockouts album? Yeah, that actually, that was never on a Frankie and the Knockout. He put it on as an ad endum, but it was done, that was done post right. uh, Eric Carmen. And that was done actually at my studio and so I can't remember what I know. Definitely playing bass, I, I, probably some other instruments. Um, mm -hmm. But that was a recording at my studio that I had in in, in New York City. Um, so, but the song actually, it's how I met Frankie. I was working with a fellow named David Prater. Um, I'm trying to think of how we were working together. We were working on some tracks, and um, he was also working with Frankie. So it was a mutual studio we were working at. And Frankie was looking for songs for his new record. He was going to try and do a Frankie and the Knockouts record. And David said, well, listen to this track this guy John D. Nicola has. And so it was basically Hungry Eyes, you know, without the vocal on it. Uh, and, and then Frankie said, wow, this is really cool. And he took it home with him and he, you know, came up with what he, you know, the melody and, and the lyric. The melody was sort of laid out a bit with the, keep blang, 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 and, and there were different melodic pieces, but for the most part, it was just, it was the track as you hear it, minus the vocal. And Frankie, you know, took it from there. And um, we, we were, that's how we met. And we started working together. And then at that moment, Frankie got a call from Jimmy Einer, said, whatever you're doing, drop it. I have this project. It's going to change your life, as Frankie probably told you. And um, so we, he gave us some parameters um, for the time of my life. I've had the time of my life. He, you know, he said it needs to start slow and then, you know, build kind of like uh, what a feeling, you know, that kind of a vibe. And um, so we, we worked on that track. Uh, I worked with my friend Donald Markowitz and we came up with that music. And... Um, they when they heard uh, you probably have heard the time of my life story with dirty dancing how it got in there I, I, um i'll i have to skip that and just go to after that song was solidly in the movie they said do you have anything else and we said well there's this other song hungry eyes so we played it for them and they loved it loved it they originally we're going to put it in the scene uh, where love man is where she's carrying the watermelons and they said well that doesn't really work there and then they put it, they said, well, it'll work in this scene where they, you know, they do the dance, uh, teaching her how to dance and with, do the sort of menage a trois dance thing. But um, um, so that's how, uh, I, I forgot your question. I think it was how we, Frank and I yeah. came up with that, yeah. So it gets, so Hungry Eyes is arranged and it, it went, when, were you at all involved with Eric Carmen's recording or is that when you'd give it off he does his thing, and then you hear the finished product once it makes the movie and makes the soundtrack. Exactly. We, we just handed it off. And, um, you know, there was talk of Frankie doing the song, um, and which I would have been involved in. And then we were getting ready to do it, and we went in to go look at another scene with Emil Ardolino, the director, and Eleanor Bergstein, the writer. And we said, well, yeah, we're going to get ready to go record Hungry Eyes. He goes, no, that's already, we already have that. <laughs> so <laughs> Eric Carmen had already submitted that. I think Jimmy worked something out with Eric. I don't, I don't even know how that happened, but I'm certainly not complaining. <laughs> um, 
on I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes, as you're writing these songs, what, what did you think was the potential of each of them? Obviously, a Hungry Eyes being one you started before any of this. And then I've had the time of my life under that different scenario where you're like, okay, let's write this for the movie. But as, as you're finishing this up, what did you think was the potential? Did you think they could reach to the point of becoming these iconic tent poles of one of the big hit movies of the late 1980s? No, no, I don't think anybody involved um, could have imagined where it would go. Um, you know, you always, you know, you always put your best work forward. You know, you, you, you need to, you need to be prepared and you need to be ready and you need to put your best foot, put foot forward. But like I said, I don't think anybody, as Emil Ardolino said at the time, he said, it just, things just came. It was like an alignment of the stars and the moon and the sun and, there's there's no way to explain how it took off the way it did it's just it, just an alignment of some sort and um no one expected you know that even uh, eleanor that the film company was kind of playing it down and wanting to go directly to the uh, vhs or what that was called VHS. <laughs> um, and uh you know so you know, we continue to be, to this day, to be awed by the acceptance of the movie and those songs and the play now that, you know, the play has all been all over the world. And um, the play is, is, you almost feel it more. You feel it's all building to that time of my life moment. It, it just, you just, feel, when you're in the theater, it just, oh, I hit this phone again. This phone again. Um, um, you're just waiting for that big moment and, and it comes. <laughs> was so. there, as the movie does come out and it's starting to become more and more popular and you start to see the songs, first I've had the time of my life, then Hungry Eyes in succession on the charts, was there like one particular moment where you kind of went, oh my gosh, this is, not only is this like, is this starting to have an impact, but this is starting to take a life of its own. What's happening? Kind of that, that moment of, this is almost out of our control. Let's just, let's watch what the universe takes this. Yeah. Yeah, no, there was that moment because initially, I think the film, the popularity of the film um, was, was being pushed by, by the crowds. And then the song, became popular on the radio and stuff. And that started pushing the film. So one pushed the other at different moments. But I, I would say when uh, I can remember maybe the third time I saw it or whatever, <clears throat> I was in a theater on the Upper West Side where I was living. And the, there was some people in front of me at the end of the movie and they were waiting, waiting, waiting. There, oh, there it is, the time of my life. That's, that's you know, I, that's what, it was a good hint for me that the song was meaning something to people, you know, and, and, you know, as I said, first the film pushed the song and then the song pushed the film, I think. But how do you explain 33 years later? That's, that's the question, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the billboard article uh, on our version, my version, um, you know, kind of says that 33 years later, Dirty Dancing is still able to put a song on the, top 30 charts you know it's sort of crazy really but, well the thing that always struck yeah because it was what always struck me about that soundtrack was how it was churning out multiple hits there's a second soundtrack that comes out which at the at, at the time and I, oh man, I was a kid at the time but i knew enough i was listening to casey case i'm like every sunday morning so i'd always be hearing here's another song from dirty dancing and then they'd say what's on the album chart what's number one the dirty dancing soundtrack it seemed like that soundtrack or at least music from or related to the movie count the second soundtrack uh it seemed to occupy a spot in pop culture for like a good half or th almost maybe even three quarters of a year did you kind of feel the same way in real time as you're watching your songs be part of this? Yes. 
Yeah, and uh, actually the Dirty Dancing, More Dirty Dancing, as it was titled, was an awesome record because it had a lot of the Otis Redding and um, um, uh, what's the other gentleman's name? Um, I can't think of his name, but uh, uh, Sol Solomon Burke. Uh, it had a bunch of those songs on there. I mean, it, it's uh, Eleanor Bergstein, the writer, uh, wrote a lot of the, the you know, the, the oldie songs into the script. So those songs were written into the script. And then Jimmy had the foresight to put, I think six or seven new songs into the into it um, to generate the soundtrack that uh, you're right was was in the charts between those two records probably six months. I know, I think um, the first record was number one for 20 weeks. Yeah, the, the soundtrack. Yeah, and you know those those days um, seem to be a little bit over. That the film soundtrack albums seemed to be not as uh, prevalent as they were. Uh, you know, that that was it was a big moment um, in, in the 80s and, you know, where those, I think starting with, um, um, uh, what was the name of that movie that had, uh, um, I can't think of the name. I shouldn't bring up things I can't remember. There was a very, one of the first soundtrack movies, mostly Motown songs, but that was sort the of like the- chill. Thank you, uh, the big chill, and um, that was sort of the template. And then from there, you know, you had the um, uh, what a feeling, and uh, you know, fame, and uh, um, the one with Kevin, um, um, the dance, uh, was the one with the Kevin Bacon. Uh, anyway, those are the templates. All of those, yeah. And uh, and then the, uh, the 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 Dirty Dancing soundtrack really just seemed to be almost at the top of that, you know, and, uh, I think there was the bodyguard afterward, which was also a giant seller, which I actually have some friends on that wrote some songs for that. But, um, you know, that, that genre seems to be a little bit um, um, not happening at the moment for some reason. I don't, I don't know. It was the blockbuster, you know, song track movies. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Absolutely. Um, so you now do a new version of I've Had the Time of My Life and you stripped it way down compared to the original. Why did you want to take that particular approach to the new arrangement? Well, that was what like the last song I did for the record because I, 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 was, I was conflicted on whether it should even be on there. I mean, how, how do you do that song? It's iconic. It's been sung by you know, Bill Medley, Jennifer Warren, who were just awesome singers, and um, Michael Lloyd produced the, the recording, and it's big, and it's it's um, euphoric, and and all those things. And I and I said, I, I, how am I going to do that? I can't do that. So uh, rather than not do it at all, it hit me to just strip it way down, just to acoustic guitar and some French horns. And I had uh, my friend Cassidy Ladden, who also sings on Everything You on the record, just do some harmonies with me. So it's just, it's stripped down and, and it's just verse, chorus, bridge, out. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I felt like that was the only way to get it across. It, it was really just a, uh, an homage and a um, you know, punctuation and, a, and an appreciation of the song um, on my behalf. I just, I, I couldn't leave it off and I couldn't try and match it. <laughs> so right. I, I just, but you know, I'm really happy with the way it came out because it's, it shows what a great song it is because it's, it's just stripped way down and the melody, you know, carries it. And, you know, I, I'm, I couldn't be happier with uh, the approach. You mentioned Cassidy Ladin and her presence on a couple songs. I, I personally have never heard her voice until I was listening through the album. Um, I'm, obviously, she's had roles, et, et cetera, but but I'd not heard her in, in this in that particular context till there. Uh, why did you uh, include her? How did you c connect with her um, well, Cass for this? Yeah, Cassidy. Uh, I've always really loved her voice, and I've always loved her as a person. Um, 
and she had sung some demos for me. Um, well, now it's coming back to me. She actually sang the demo of Everything You at the time uh, when we were we were kind of promoting it to try and sell it to an artist, you know, to have somebody cover it. <clears throat> and so Cassidy was the voice then, wasn't originally a duet. So uh, we, when I retracked it, um, I, I had Cassidy come in and, and redo it with my voice and her voice. And um, we did keep the original piano part, which was played by Glenn Burtnick, the mm. artist Glenn Burtnick. Yeah. And he just captured a feel, um, sort of a Todd Rundgren up, gives it that up bubbly feeling. And so, um, so you know, I, I guess Cassidy is a lot of, my, a lot of times my go-to for harmonies and vocals uh, um, and uh, her voice just seemed to be the right voice for both applications for the time of my life and, and uh, everything here. I caught some of the, the chords on this album. You mentioned the Todd Rundgren kind of, um, I saw the light style seventh, yeah. major sevenths in there. And right. then right before that, at the conclusion of the song right before that, there's it, the song ends on, it sounded like to me like a seventh chord as well. And I'm hearing both of those and at the, just the, the musician in me perks up like, oh, okay, this is something more than just the, the basic chords. Um, how, how much do you like to put in stuff other than the, the usual, the, the basics, the go-to pop stuff? How much do you prefer to add in other kind of altered chords or different kinds of arrangements in your songwriting? Well, you know, if, it, if the song calls for it, you know, I, I, with, I, I'm a, a pretty much a, a feel player. I just, I just go for it. I, 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 there's not much thought in what I do. Um, it's, it's all just in, inert, <laughs> it just comes out of me. Um, so um, it, it, there's also on the first song, um, You're the Only One, it's C major seven, F major seven, the whole, the whole first verse mm -hmm. is, is like that. They're kind of uh, chords, you know, not unlike um, and that song, um, not unlike what a Jimmy Webb, uh, you know, Glenn Campbell, Jim, Jimmy Webb, uh, he used that kind of thing. It, it's a very uplifting um, sort of, uh, you know, when you put those kind of chords in, it, it just, you can't help but feel good. You know, they're, they're, um, they're just feel good uh, chords. Just that major seventh just adds that sort of, it's it's feel good, but it's it's also goes to your core a little bit, you know, like like a D minor seven goes to the core. So does a C major seven. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It just yep. it just there's something about them that just you go, oh, that's nice. You know, that makes me feel good. Who are your most admired songwriters? Well, I I I gotta mention Jimmy Webb, which I already did. Um, you know, um, Don Lyman. Uh, by the time I get to Phoenix, MacArthur's Park, I know they're all old songs now, but but um, listen to them <laughs> and tell me they're not wonderful. Um, you know, Stevie Wonder. Um, uh, Why, well, gosh, I have to mention Steve Winwood. I, I just, you know, I was weaned on that even though he's not that much older than me uh you know he was already doing it when he was 17 you know um uh, with spencer davis so um you know his, his stuff uh and, and in a modern context um kevin parker from tame impala i just love what he does not not unlike some of the uh, you know modern songwriters sort of have a, a less of a you know in, in the old days it was like don't bore us, get us to the chorus, you know, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, you know, and, and modern songwriters seem to go more linear, and, and, you know, not necessarily come back, you know, and they just let it go where it, the song takes them. And uh, I, I, I admire that. And um, I try and incorporate that in my new stuff that I'm doing. I'm just trying to be more, you know, cognizant of, you know, well, you don't have to go back to that, you know, go, let it go, let it go somewhere else. So, um, you know, so Kevin Parker, um, who else do I love? 
Well, you know, I, I, I'm also going to date myself with a, a band, um, Moby Grape and, and um, Peter Lewis, uh, and um, who I just produced a record for on my record label, uh, Peter Lewis, who is a, a founding member of Moby Grape. And um, so, so those are some of the people I, I love. Uh, of you have a, you mentioned Glenn Burtnick, uh, Mickey Madden's part of the album. You mentioned uh, Peter Lewis with his daughter, I think is also part of the project as well. Right. So how do, yeah, so how do you, how did you, I mean, there, you can describe the connections in there in the press releases, but, but how, how did you decide which people in particular to bring in for these songs? Yeah, you got to know many other people. Why did you decide this particular roster to bring in? It's a great question. Uh, um, it's whoever just hit me in the face, you know, um, at that moment. You know, I, I, Glenn, I think, because he played such a great part, so we kept it. Uh, Arwen, you know, uh, we did a record with Arwen, and uh, I wanted to bring her in. Her and Cassidy are actually singing back up on Hungry Eyes. Um, Brian Delaney is kind of, other than my son, Brian Delaney has been my go-to drummer, uh, a guy named Rob Bailey, also guitar-wise, uh, although I played most of the stuff. He only played on a song or two. But um, uh, a, a, do you know the band The Elevators? Um, um, Zonder Kennedy, who lives down the hollow from me, uh, plays that great blues solo in uh, Brand New Day. Um, so I knew he was a, I was looking for a Pink Floyd-ish blues solo in that middle section and he lived right down the street. And so he, uh, I shouldn't say street, I should say hollow. So he came down and, uh, you know, just wailed away. Um, it was whoever was, um, you know, the, the guy who plays Fender Rhodes, Max Weigel, who was in my son's band, Fovia, uh, I just, thought he'd, he'd play, because of the way he thinks, he'd play the chords on a, on a Fender Rhodes differently than I would. So I, I wanted him on that. Um, most of the synths I did. Um, Mickey, Mickey Madden, of course. Um, I worked with, uh, my at the time, my partner Tommy Allen and I um, produced their, their Maroon 5 were used to be the Kara's Flowers, and we produced their first record. And so I've known Mickey all these years. And when I mentioned to Mickey that I was doing a record, and uh, particularly when I said that the song I, I wanted him to play bass on um, was co-written with John Waite, Anthony Kryzon, myself, and Keith Reed from Procol Harum fame, Whiter Shade of Pale, uh, he's being a huge Procol Harum fan, you know, really wanted to play bass on that song. So he's on In God's Shadow, which John Waite had recorded on his record uh, in, in the 90s. So um, it's, it's a great question. And I, I, I think it was just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, Peter sings on the song, Peter Lewis sings on uh, I Am Not Willing. And that was one of the two cover songs I did that's a Moby Grape song. It's his song. So I had him sing uh, harmony on that. He, and funny enough, he said the harmony he sang on it was one he could never get the guys in Moby Grape to sing. <laughs> so he finally got to hear that harmony after all these years. Oh, that's so that's good. what he sang on there. So it was really just happenstance, whoever uh, came to mind at that moment. You know. You mentioned John Waite. What was, uh, what's the process of writing with him going back a quarter century and then fast forward to now because i understand from i think it was from the all access article that you mentioned that, that there are other there's other material that you've worked on with him correct me if i'm wrong in that but what's the process of of writing with john Waite? that's that's a great question too because john is uh different than most people that i've worked with uh, you get in a room with john and you just start playing and he just sings off the top of his head words that just come out. Or if I have a track, he'll just come in and, and we'll just keep punching. You know, what did, what did, what did I just say there? And, and then we'll go back and he, he kind of stream of consciousness and, and it's a really interesting um, 
process to, to work with John. Uh, he's a, uh, a you know wonderful, great singer and a great writer. And uh, he does it. And I find a lot of people, although, you know, maybe not in the studio, punching in and punching out, but a lot of uh, people write sort of stream of consciousness. I, I was reading a book on um, um, Wilco and um, he was saying that, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but what's the guy in Wilco? <laughs> uh, anyway. I'm blanking too, but I know who you were talking about. Yeah. No, I put, um, I, I should know it, but uh, you know he's he says he does that. He just starts singing, and then he um, sort of looks at what did I just say, and then just sort of expounds on that and, and builds on that. And uh, you know, it, there are certain melodies that incur certain vowels and and, and stuff. So uh, I think that you know a lot of uh, I'm not a lyricist. Uh, I can help edit lyrics, but I'm I'm not a lyricist. So, uh, but I've seen a lot of guys do it that way. So John John is fun to write with. Um, um, we maybe I mentioned it in that article. Uh, he he had heard some old demos we did recently and contacted me and said, "God, these were great songs. Maybe we should put them out." So we've been talking about that. That's something to look forward to. That's something yeah. good. We have something on the agenda. If yep. you could have anybody record one of your songs or a, a few people based on the type of song it is, maybe different artists, who would they be? Um, you know, it's hard because a lot of them are songwriters themselves and I, I wouldn't try, try to impose <laughs> on great songwriters. But if Steve Winwood sang a song of mine, uh, Kevin Parker from Tame and Paula, um, uh, you know, um, who else would I love to have? Did I say Stevie Wonder? No. That'd uh, be a good one. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of in a modern context. Maybe someone like um, um, Katy Perry or, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I, you know, um, I, I sort of, for years, I was still writing in, in the popular vernacular of the day, but it's gotten to be so, uh, at this point, and I don't want to sound like an old man, but, you know, a lot of the modern pop music it's interchangeable with voices. It's like, well, that that song could be sung by this one or that one or that one. So that, and I, but I I always like to try and stay contemporary, and so I I work on tracks like that from time to time. But in the middle of it, I go, I don't know, this is really what I want to do. Let me, I, I can do all these other things that I, I really like to do. Uh, I've really gotten analog, as maybe you can see around here. I, <laughs> I, I really, really enjoy uh, putting a microphone to, to a tape machine. Oh, wow, a, yes, yes. 16 track, two inch. Uh, which oh, I nice. have a, yeah, I used to have a 24 <laughs> track here in the day. But um, recently I did a record with a band called The Size, uh, who I did a record for them in the 90s, with them in the 90s. And uh, we, um, it was just a, um, a five song EP and uh, I had a two track quarter inch. And just for the heck of it, I ran two t tracks at a time through the quarter inch. And when I played it back for them, they were like, wow. I mean, you just really, heard the sonic so it was recorded digitally and then two tracks at a time sent into a tape machine and back and um there was a huge difference i mean i knew there would be a difference but i didn't like it was like wow so that prompted me to get a, a two inch 16 because it's the same ratio as a quarter inch two track is the same amount of tape uh per track as a two inch 16 track and gosh I have to tell you like recording drums and stuff it's just big and fat and gorgeous sounding so I, I enjoy that you know as opposed to a modern pop tune you're 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 taking a 
sampled kick and a sampled, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a different thing. I, I, it, and, and it's not easy either, but I, I, at this stage in my career, I just like to do what I, I, I like to do, you know? So you've got, you, as I mentioned, writing songs with John Wade and doing what you like to do, which is create music. What, what are your other future plans, uh, artistically speaking? Um, as a song, as an artist, as opposed to a producer, uh, I'm, I'm working on new songs for another record for myself. Um, I, I just, I just did a, just released a, a cover of Blind Faith's Can't Find My Way Home, uh, which I was really happy with the way they came out. And because uh, it was a little bit of sacrilege to cover a Steve Winwood song, sung a song because he's one of the greatest voices of all time. But um, I, I was happy with the, with the way that came out. So I'm working on n new songs for myself. Um, uh, while we were in quarantine, my son and his friend uh, were here for a couple of months and we started recording uh, some tracks. Um, so we'll probably get finish those. Um, there is um, my son's band, Fovia, which is another uh, project that we have to finish up. And um, I started writing a song with Zonder Kennedy down down the street here um and we're going to start tracking that soon so you know just um different stuff I, I i was working with an artist kendra erica who um um a friend of mine is managing she's out, out of florida she was um doing a lot of dance music and and they were trying to um sort of get some music that wasn't so dance oriented so uh, I kind of worked on a track with her for her, and um, you know, just just um, I, I love being in this room recording, um, and it's it's wonderful here because I can just come in here and go outside for you know outside in this you know we're in a kind of an ex dairy area <laughs> and. Um, so it's rolling hills and, and mountains and, um, you know, I can go inside and I can come back out, you know. So um, I'm kind of all over the place, but, uh, but uh, enjoying every, every minute of it. And, um, you know, really um, happy with uh, the way the record has been um, received and, and have certainly this um, surprising top 30 uh, billboard uh, I'm curious to see where it goes from here. Uh, we got the next couple of weeks and see what happens. It, you know, as an indie label, it's it, you know it becomes difficult. You know, competing against Sony and and all the others. So, um, curiously enough, Maroon Five I think is number one on the chart at the moment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's basically it. It's good company to have right now, and uh, something's working. Obviously, something people want to hear about that song again and again. John DeNicola, uh, the album, um, The Why Because, Hungry Eyes, currently on the AC charts, and who knows whatever comes next. There's plenty more to come. John, thanks for taking time to chat about this today. It's very insightful, a lot of music history there, and all the best going forward with all your writing, producing, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Thanks so much, Luke. I, I really appreciate it. Welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.